Welcome to Rialto Channel's Real Women podcast. I'm Francesca Budkin. Rena Owen is one of New Zealand's most treasured actors. After training to be an actor in London, Rena lived and breathed theatre for eight years in the UK before returning to New Zealand in the late 80s. In 1994, Rena made her mark with an unforgettable performance as Beth Hickey in the iconic Kiwi film Once Were Warriors. Since then, she has gone on to become one of the country's most successful working actors. She is the only actress in the world to date to have worked with both Hollywood directors Steven Spielberg and George Lucas. With a list of theatre, film and television credits to her name, Rena has done it all, all over the world. And she joins me now. Rena, thanks so much for being with us. Oh, kia ora. Very happy to be with you all. Now, when you look at your career, it has been so diverse and so full and um, fulfilling, I am sure. You've played so many different roles, worked in so many different mediums. If you do look at your career to date, are there pivotal moments that you know, really mean something to you, either moments that gave you great opportunity or gave you the motivation to keep carrying on or gave you great joy. Can you pick out of this incredibly successful career a few of those moments? Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that one's going to take take an autobiography. There, there's, there's just been so many. Well, aren't you supposed um, to be writing an autobiography? One day when I when I get time, but <laughs> I haven't had time to do that. But but one day for sure. There's there's just so many. Uh, I mean, I, you, you can't you, you just can't jump to one or two because it's an accumulation. Mm. Everything you go through in your your youth and then your your young adulthood and then your mature years, it all accumulates to those moments. So it's, it almost feels. You know, it's not fair that I just go and pick this one moment from Warriors versus, well, hey, my principal at my high school is the man I credit with my acting career. And I have to give that credit way back to when essentially I was born creative, hypersensitive, very dramatic, highly imaginative, and, and of course, as I've already said, hypersensitive. And um, I wrote and I performed in my childhood in the Māori Club, and uh, I was first published when I was eight, when I entered a children's poetry contest, aged eight. And I won a whole five bucks. And then as a result of being in the, in the Kapahaka group, the, the principal of Bay of Islands College saw me performing the male haka. And he said to the head of the English department, Mr. Gage, you need to audition that young Owen girl because I think she's got something. And so I auditioned in my first role at the age of 15, going on to 16 with Bloody Mary in South Pacific. And then I got promoted to the lead of Clemity Jane and Clemity Jane, and I did a few uh, plays for the community. So I knew as a young person that I found mm. my place in the world, that I'd found my voice, and I, I found where I belonged. However, at the end of the 70s, when it came time for me to leave high school, being an actor was not an, a career option for me. Being a woman, being an actor was not a career option. My my choices as a woman were I could be a secretary, a teacher, or a nurse. And, you know, and at that time we had no role models. We didn't see diversity on our screens. So, and coming out of the sticks uh, from Moirua in the Bay of Islands, uh, I applied for teaching and nursing, trained as a, a nurse, and then went off to London as, as the age of 22 with plans of going to med school to become a doctor. But, uh, Life got the better of me, and I did what young people uh, do. And, uh, you know, for better or worse, that life-changing experience in London, um, it put me on back onto an artistic path because I, you, I did... You did, you did meet a... Sorry, you did meet a British uh, actress yes. who, who yes. mentored and inspired you. That's Is that right? right? But be, mm. even, even, even before her... Uh, so, you know, in a nutshell, as a young person, I played with fire and I got burnt. I got caught up in drugs. But the good thing about coming off all of that and getting out of that, because I realized that was not what I wanted, was I, I went through intensive therapy. And it helped me to, to find myself and, um, and to de determine what I really wanted to do with my life. And I, I really do believe that the arts, whether you're a writer, actor, whatever, are a path to self-discovery and self-healing. And... Um, so I committed to going to drama school, and I did. I started to go to drama school in London, a place called the Actors Institute in Islington. 
And a neighbor who I was living with in the same block heard that I was wanting to be an actor. And he came down one day and he said, hey, there's this advert in this newspaper looking for New Zealand actresses. So I looked at it and I thought, oh, my God, I've got to go for that. So that was my first big break. That was a pivotal moment because that play was Hilary Beaton's Outside In. And that stay was, stage play was being put together by Theatre New Zealand. And it had icons like Annabelle Lomaz, Kenny Moore, Alda. Um, it's got it's so many of us. That was my first professional experience as an actor, was doing a New Zealand play on the other side of the world. Uh, and that play, which we fortunate to have Hilary Beaton direct that play because she'd written it and we toured it and we had the best time at the Edinburgh Festival and then it was after that that I joined a woman's uh, theatre company called Clean Break in London where I would go on to meet my mentor Anne Mitchell who was most famous at the time for being the leading lady as Dolly in Linda LaPlante's Widows. So I learned a lot of basic 101 stuff from Anne. I'd written this play and she agreed to work on it and she went on to direct it. So that play got produced in London and I had novel options for that play. And um, and my father died, which is what brought me back to New Zealand. Um, and the uncanny timing was, the, and these are all moments because I've been in the right place at the right time. But in order to be in the right place at the right time, you've got to position yourself for those moments. You've mm. got to be prepared for them. And there's too many, including myself at points of my younger career, where you think it's going to fall out of the sky. And no, it never falls out of the sky. You've got to do the work. You've got to get your butt out of bed. You've got to learn your craft. And I set out to be a good actor. And, uh, and when I got back to New Zealand for my father's funeral at the end of 1988, uh, my sister was working at Māori Affairs. Another pivotal moment. She said, OK, I need to take you down to meet Don Sowen, who was working at Waitaro there in Hearn Bay. And Don Sowen and Mary Pa were setting up the Etipu at Air series, which were the first one-hour dramas written by Māori, made by Māori, for Māori, with, for TVNZ. And so I auditioned for a couple of those. I got cast in Rawiri Paratene's uh, variations of a scene which was directed by Don Sowen and in Riwia Brown's Roy Mata, which she directed, and on that I also met Lee Tamahori. And pretty much the top of our Māori practitioners, actors or behind the, the scenes, people like uh, Rewa Hare, uh, a cinematographer, Sharon Hawke, and so many other names, Christina Asher and Karen Sidney, we all came through Don Sowen's stable. So, you know, and we got the best uh, of of the best from Don Sowen and Mary Power, and then, of course, Medata came in, and there was Witi Ihimaira, and there were all of these people that fed into the creation of who I am. Jim Moriarty, and Larry, let me, I, I must not forget Barry Barclay, because I had the great honor of meeting with Barry Barclay in 89, and his film was the first I saw, Nati. And I never forget sitting there watching this film because I thought, this is exactly what I want to do with my life. Write these kind of stories and make these kind of films that were about Māori and Māori community. And his was the first film I saw, Nati, fresh off the plane from London. And then, of course, Mira Mita's film and then Patu. And there's only a couple of things around then at the end of mm. the 80s. Rena, do you, did you see yourself? You, you know, you mentioned that when you were growing up yourself, you didn't you didn't see yourself represented on film and in television. Do you do you, do you think of yourself as a as a trailblazer, as uh, as as a as a mentor to to younger yes, women and Maori yes. coming through the through the uh, yes. industry at this point? Yes, and it's not even Maori. It's all Kiwis. Yes. It's all Kiwis who dare to dream. And who've got the courage to get their butt out of the bed and do whatever it takes to make their dreams come true. It's a universal thing. And, and it's a thing that pleased me most about the success of Once Were Warriors is that that film told little brown children, Māori, Samoan, Tongan, children of colour, that they could be filmmakers, that they could be writers, actors, directors. So for me, because I'm, 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 I'm both. Um, my my dad's Māori. I was raised with our on our land on our family up in Kauai, Moira Otiri. I was grew up in, in in you know deep in our culture, 
and my mother was Pākehā, so I represent both. You know, and, and i got to say something. I remember my mum at one point, because I always, you know, when there was warriors and every headline would go, Māori this, Māori that, and she would, would always be, well, what about me? Where do I fit into that equation? <laughs> you know, and, and, and so I'm not biased to one or the other. I'm both, and I like to, just because I think the great thing about being a creative or an artist is it is all about humanity. Yes. It's all about the human condition. And, and yes, I have been a trailblazer, and I have been in my career involved in the first of a lot of things, that first Air to Pure Air series. After that, Jim Moriarty took me to Wellington for the first ever Theatre Marae season at the depot, which a few years later was renamed Takirua. I was the first to, to go to Tahiti to, to act in a, in a film made all by Tahitians. I was the first to go to Rotuma to act in a film that was made by the first Rotuman. I was the first to act in a f- short film that was made by all Polynesian in, in L.A. So, yeah, there's been a lot of firsts. So, indeed, there's, a, there's been a lot of trail. Tra- a lot of trail have, have blazed the trail. And, you know, I, I often don't say this because it's not in our Kiwi nature to brag or show off. I'd like to see that change for our children. Because in my childhood, and still I still see it quite commonly, a lot of our children feel like they have to hide their talents. And they don't want to stick out and they don't want to stand out because they're very of an age where they want to belong. And it's particularly hard for Pacific Islanders, Māori, Samoan, Tongans, because we're tribal. We come from a rohe and we have this profound need to belong to our communities. And I've seen a lot of talent go to waste in my lifetime. A lot of talent go to waste. And so this is what I'm saying. It, it, it comes down first, you, the person, me, going, okay, I've got this in dream, dream, and I believe impossible dreams exist to be created. And I was willing to, to do whatever it took to be a good actor. Because I always remember Michael Caine saying this, and I was really lucky to learn from some of the best in London in the 80s. He said, look... He said, if you're setting out for fortune and fame, he said, forget it. He said, set out, to, set out to be a good actor. And if by being a good actor brings you fortune and fame, then you're blessed. Because I always like to acknowledge the 90%, if not more, of our industry who give their, their lives to this career, who don't have the privilege I've had, which is to be in a breakout movie or to be in a breakout TV series, who've never had a hit, but have still given selflessly of themselves, to the arts, because I think we all know here in New Zealand the arts is not particularly rewarding financially, which is why most of us end up having to go overseas to make some bucks. Did you ever, was there ever a time, Rena, where you thought about quitting? Oh, many, many, <laughs> many times. Uh, yeah. Right back to the, right back to the, you know, God, dude, my life is full of so many moments. Right back to theatre, you don't make any money doing theatre. So you're running around. Or right back when I was in drama school, I would clean toilets. I would do this foot-foot job of delivering newspapers to Fleet Street. I would wait tables. I did whatever it took in order for me to go to classes to learn about acting. Um, Because when you're focused on the passion and the purpose, it doesn't matter what you're doing for bucks because that's just to pay your rent. It's not you. As some people would say to me in my early days as in the theatre, they go, oh, so you, you, you're poor. And I go, oh, no, hell no. I'm the richest woman in the world. I'm doing exactly what I want to do and what I love doing. I just don't have any money. <laughs> okay, so there's got to be a lot of things that have got to drive you because there's many times. And one of those was right before Warriors where I said to my mum, I'm working my butt off, I'm doing multiple jobs to pay rent and I've got nothing to show for my efforts. And she'd always just say, hang in there, girl. And this is another very pivotal moment, working in Wellington Theatre as a writer, actor, director, producer. I got asked by Dylan Bookstore, because I read once for Warriors. And I'm not really a book reader, but when I read it, I thought whoever wrote this knew this lifestyle. And if this book's ever made into a movie, that is a role to die for. Well, Dylan Bookstore called me up and said, hey, we're launching Ellen Duff's second book one night out stealing and we'd like to stage a reading. Would you be able to get a Māori actor and and put it together? And I said, sure, you know, send me the chapter or the paragraph you want read. I lined up a Māori actor who didn't turn up on the night. And Ellen Duff thought this whole idea was just silly. 
Um, and anyway, the publisher's freaking out. She's like, well, what are we going to do, Rena? Because uh, my Māori actor got stuck in Auckland. And I said, well, I'll, I'll just have to bloody read the thing myself. <laughs> so so Al, Alan, had his back, Alan had his back turned to me. And I start to read this passage. And he turned to me, slowly but surely turned to me, and he looked and he listened. And he came up to me at the end of it and he said, you read that exactly the way I wrote it. How did you do that? And I said, well, I'm an actor. And he said, have you ever read my book, Once We're Warriors? Because you'd be a great best. And I said, yes, I have read Once We're Warriors, and I can't wait to audition for it. And anyway, got the publisher to give me the book of Once We're Warriors. And in it, he wrote, uh, to dear Renna, maybe my best one day. I hope so. Uh, and so how that, many years before? before the, uh, one or two years before we actually made the movie. Oh. Goodness, meant you know, to be, Rena. Meant to many, be. Of course, it was. There's many, many moments in my career, and 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 I still to this day it remains true that I always believed, and I think this is the key to getting through the valleys because you can't get to the mountain top without going through the valleys, and those valleys are real, and that's the valleys are very, very real for creatives, very real, and you know my my mentor Anne going back. London she said to me she said no one has ever sustained in full-time acting work not even when you're famous which is what she was she said you've got to have something else that makes you want to get out of bed otherwise you'll keep falling into that black hole of depression and she said you can write don't ever give up your writing so that was always my medicine as long as I'm creative that's my medicine and that's what I've done and I wrote stage plays to write roles for myself and I spent a good 10 years uh, uh, developing uh, uh, was developing Behind the Tattooed Face, which was the first historical novel ever to be written by a Māori. And I've turned that into a screenplay, and that, that's a project I want to get made. And you just you keep going, you just keep going. You've got to keep your eye on, on the fact that it's like a calling on your life. It really is. I think the ones that stick in there, because if it's not a need, if it's just a desire, you don't laugh. And there were other times I wanted to give up. You know, 40s is tough for actresses. Because your 20s, your 30s, you're still young enough to be the chicky babe. But you get into your 40s, and you're too old to be the chicky babe, but you're too young to be the old wise sage or queer. So get to your 50s. If you've hung in there and you've still got your craft and your face still moves, I'm getting so much work in my <laughs> Well, I was just going to ask you that because I was going to say we have this perception that you get to a certain age in Hollywood or maybe anywhere around the world and all of a sudden it's very hard for women to find roles. No. But I was just, you've been yeah. working on international productions nonstop, right. it seems. Mm. And I'll tell you what my mother said. Absolutely. My mother said when I got very disheartened in my 40s and she said, just hang in there. She'd always say, just hang in there. <laughs> Cause she oh, had, Lisa. She said, me, she said to me, just remember... Dame Judi Dench and Dame Helen Mirren did not get their Hollywood breaks till their 50s. And this is the key to the 50s, providing you've got your character and you're still a good actor. And I had to make that choice my first year when I moved to L.A. and I sat in auditions room next to all of these most gorgeous creatures. And I thought, you know, and I thought, my God, is this what I have to do to work in Hollywood? And it became very clear to me, I thought, I, I cannot disfigure myself because how on earth would I ever go back and play Māori woman looking like Joan Rivers? It's just <laughs> never going to work. And, so, and it didn't pay off, but I knew. See, faith is a big part. Faith is, you can't do any of this without faith. And I just knew that one day it would pay off. And so come to my 50s, I'd get called in for auditions. And I'd say to my agent, I'm not right for this role. And he said, yeah, but they want to see you. And I'd go and I'd do the audition. I'd say that was fantastic. And I'd say, I'm not right for this role. And she says, I know, but you look great. And she said, if you looked at the list of the actresses I've brought in, boobs too big, lips too big, face doesn't move. Too, you know, she said, the, 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 the hunt for people who look real now real and, and uh, is popular and and the thing that is also equally popular is ethnically diversity you know all my poor caucasian acting friends are complaining they're getting no auditions in la because it's all about realness and, and ethnic diversity and i like to say there's been a momentum that was brought about by our youth 
Oscars are so white, an accumulation of things is our young people, this is what they're asking for. They want real. You know, they've seen a bunch of fake all their life. They've seen all of that happening in politics in, in the USA, and we won't even go there. But, you know, that's the, the extreme of reality television to a certain degree. And, uh, you know, and they, 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 they're just looking for realness in, in, their, in their content because there's so much content out there. So, yes, I continue to work on international shows. I'm still working on uh, a Disney freeform TV series called Free, uh, Siren, which shoots in Vancouver. Last year, I did the most amazing mini series called The Gloaming for Stan Australia. Um, this year, there's a lot of great work lined up. Uh, um, I can't kind of talk about any of it because it's, none of it's been made public, but it's great stuff. The other thing I've been doing these past few years is doing a reoccurring role on Seth MacFarlane's show, The Orville. Yes, yes. Uh, you, yeah. How do you how do you select a role? What what interests you? Because you you often choose very powerful characters. Well, I choose. You, you know, I choose. It's it's a kind of spiritual thing. It's one thing I was going to say earlier, and then I got a bit sidetracked. But I've always believed that I will play the roles I was put on this planet to play. Because as my, you know, one of my agents said to me many years ago, she said, I'm sorry, Rena, but you're never going to be the door ne- girl next door. You know, and it makes you realize you can only be that which you are and develop that character versus trying to be somebody you're not. And that's the gift of your 50s. Because you get to your 50s, you show up and you just go, like it or lump it, this is me. I don't really care anymore. <laughs> well, well, you do care. But you're just like, you're just more resigned. You're just more comfortable in your own skin. And you go, this is it. Whereas in your 20s, 30s, you're, you're still trying to find yourself and you're still trying to figure it all out. Um, and so those roles, I kind of always look at a role. I turned down quite a lot because I just got a bad feeling about them. I work intuitively. And, um, uh, you know, with the Seth MacFarlane one, that, see, this is interesting. So I say, that, go, go to every audition. Seth MacFarlane's pilot, I knew I wasn't right for the role, but the, once again, agent said, they want to see you. So I went in. I didn't get that role for the pilot. I went to a wonderful petite black actress, and she was perfect for the role. But episode three came up, and they all went, oh, my God, we all know who, who the actress that's right for this role. And they brought me in for Havina, and it was literally one scene, and it was a huge monologue. In, in 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 that episode of all about a girl in episode three and Seth loved it so much and you know I worked with him in the scene and he just loved the process that he wrote a whole episode for me in season two and so maybe that's going to happen again in season three so in some ways roles choose me if you know what I mean I mean yeah. I know what I I'm kind of drawn to it's like Seth MacFarlane said to me he said you're, you're a heavy hitter um, you know, and I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, you, you, you're always going to knock it out of the park. And and I guess what I went through in my personal life uh, is what gave me that emotional depth. And that's my forte, is my emotional depth and being able to bring that into my work. Having said that, I really relish the opportunities to do light, funny I don't, stuff, but they just I don't know where you're going to find the time, but you do need to find the time to write your autobiography. Yes, I will. I figure <laughs> when I'm, I figure when I'm, you know, when maybe I'm a little slower physically, and and need to slow it down and just, you know, sit back in my lazy boy chair and just sit there at my laptop more, and then only go off and do the odd acting job is when I'll write that book. But I've had extraordinary experiences and. And I'm um, sure there's more to come. Oh, uh, well, I think the one I have to say, which is a show off, and I didn't know this, I learned this from a Star Wars fan, but there are only six actors in the entire world who've ever worked with George Lucas and Steven Spielberg. I am the only female. The only actress. So the, the only actress in the whole world to have worked with both, and I, I worked with them back to back, and they were extraordinary moments. 
Um, so if any one of the, anything happened to one of those, that's the way it will remain in history. The only actress. Not that, not that weight. you're wishing. Not that you're wishing that. No. On them. But it's a, no. no. But you know, even if there is another one, then I'm, I've become one of two. Yeah, because the others are all guys, <laughs> like Samuel Jackson and Liam Neeson, and there's only a handful in the world that have worked with both of those filmmaking legends. And um, yeah, I've had extraordinary. Uh, opportunities and I've positioned myself and I've worked for it and I've also been lucky and I've had many, many people who've supported me along the way. You know, there's this old Fakatoki that I remember Tim sharing at the awards when he won, as rightfully so, he won for, for Jake the Muff mm. in the New Zealand Film Awards and he shared the Fakatoki and I can't remember it in Māori but he essentially said I am, I am not the strength of one, I am the strength of many. And, and it's so true, so true to all of us, all of us, irregardless of We are always the strengths of our parents and our siblings and our extended whanos and our families and then our business teams and then the entire cast and crew of every production. It, it takes a village to to do these things. And, and it, it, it's a work of collaboration and you've got to... You know, you've got to be willing to show up and, and be open, which means, you, you you know, allow yourself to be vulnerable and just be there to be of service. And I think that's the other great thing about getting into your 50s. It's not about me, me, me anymore, which it certainly is when you're younger. Um, you know, youth is, is the epitome of self-obsession because that's all they've got. That's all they know. They're trying to find themselves. And, um, you know, they have no concept of death or, or risk or you know, to think of the things I did when I was young, my goodness. Um, so it's great to get to this point where you go, great, I've got some wonderful opportunities ahead of me, but also being very aware that I've moved into this chapter of my life now in my fifth. Well, I'm actually, you know, I'm looking at 60 on the horizon, where it's about, okay, how do I want to spend the next decade of my life? And I know that a big part of that is building up a foundation to to help our youth and, um Things I've I've had a passion to do for a long. I want to get but I want to get behind the tattooed face, mate. That's my labour of love. Um, I've always wanted to set up a foundation for talented youth, uh, for rural kids, because you know, grown up rural, we didn't get opportunities city kids got, and um, you know, and it, it's it's not about race and it's not about what field. It's just a kid that has to have talent in sports or education or painting or acting or kapahaka where their parents don't have the money to buy them a uniform or send them to a workshop or send them on a trip or just something like that because you know the greatest investment and I've always known this which is why I've done it with young filmmakers too the greatest investment you can make is into a living human being because that living human being goes on and invests in others and um you know, I often get asked, do you ever get sick of being asked to cook some eggs? And I go, no, that's the privilege. That's the privilege of being in something that, that made a difference. That is you very know? graceful of you. But it's true. Mm. It's a, it, you know, it's a double-edged sword, but it's every actor. You look at John Travolta, I'll always think Saturday Night Fever. I'll always think that. You, you just, it's that film that launches you. But it wasn't just the film that launched me, as people said and continue to say to this day, that film rocked the, the bottom of their world, especially those who lived those kind of lives. Mm. You know, to have done something that made a difference and that changed a lot. And because um, I did hear on radio recently some a guy was saying, oh, well, it didn't make any difference. But actually the woman said, we're talking about it. It made a difference, domestic violence. And I, I'm excited for us. I mean, I'm excited by what I heard last night just coming out of Tyker's mouth. I didn't see the Oscars, but I saw the clip um, that he said about uh, Indigenous children and, and original storytellers. And he ended it with a big kia ora. And I'm like, you know, this is, you know, more and more him and Cliff Curtis and Tim Yeda Morrison and I remember having this chat with Cliff Curtis 10 years ago in LA and I said I always feel torn that I should be back in New Zealand helping our youth and he said yeah but you're still helping them by being here and, and trailing Absolutely. the blaze or blazing the trail and, and helping to open the door so uh, it's like you've got to do it while you can but I, I am personally really looking forward to living at home uh, you know want to live at home and then just go off and do the odd acting job when I need to and be more around at home to do those other things that I'd really like to do and 
it, it's it's been a privileged career, but it's 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 been painful. That's the other side of the word privilege, painful. Um, and that's just life, you know. Like I said earlier, you, you can't get to the mountain tops without walking through the valleys, and and you can't you can't make a rainbow without sunshine and rain. And well, we're always we're always going to be a binary species, and that's just life. As long as you get through, you just keep your eye on the keep your eye on the mountain top, and just hang in there. <laughs> that's it. It's all about perseverance. And it's all I about love perseverance. it. If I yep. hadn't have hung in there before, I wouldn't have got Once Were Warriors. If I hadn't have hung in there, I wouldn't have got the Vin Diesel movie. If I hadn't have hung in there, because I've thrown my towel in multiple times, and every time I've thrown the towel in. Boom, I get an audition. I go, oh, okay, so I'm still in the game, am I? <laughs> Here I go again. Oh, look, Here Rena, I, go again. I know I know you're really busy, so I, I thank you so much for your time today. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you and oh, really inspirational to, to, to talk to you. So thank oh, you so much. Kia ora. And listen, I'm so inspired by what, what you're all doing there at the Rialto. That goes back to another old mate of mine, Kelly. I think this is absolutely exciting and I hope I get the opportunity to see it or hear it at some point when I'm in and out of New Zealand. And good luck and, and God bless and kia kaha and kia ora. <laughs>